I wonder, do you ever feel trapped? In 2018, 12 footballers and their coach in Taiwan went into a cave on a bit of an exploration and they got down deeper and deeper into the cave and suddenly the floodwaters rose up and they were trapped in the cave. And it wasn't an easy way out either. For 18 days, these boys and their coach were trapped in the cave and the outsiders were going, how are we going to rescue these boys? And if you've seen the documentary, it's incredible. They actually, they actually bring in an anaesthetist to put the boys to sleep and then to swim and to dive them out through the caves. It's an incredible rescue. Today, we are looking at the most incredible rescue in the life of Israel, not from a cave, but from the slavery in Egypt. Let's recap of where we have come from in Exodus 1 to 6. The Israelites have gone to Egypt in the days of Joseph, and Pharaoh is now not happy. There's over a million of them in his land, and he knew not Joseph. During these days, he decides to kill all of the baby boys and Moses is born but he's hidden in the basket in the Nile he's then fought by Pharaoh's daughter and he is raised in the house of Pharaoh however after killing an Egyptian he then flees as a 40 year old to Midian although during these times the Israelites begin to groan and God hears their groaning how merciful often to do so so then out in the Fails. God then calls Moses through the burning bush encounter. He says, go and rescue my people from Egypt and bring them to the promised land. So Moses goes and asks Pharaoh to let his people go. And Pharaoh says, no, <laughs> no way. Moses is despondent. That's where we were in chapters five and six. His people are not listening to him. And Pharaoh will not listen to him either. But today we're going to see a wonderful truth, a wonderful truth that we have been celebrating already this morning, that salvation belongs to the Lord. And we are going to see the problem that God sees, the people God uses, and the power God has as we journey very quickly through Exodus chapter 7. So firstly, the problem God sees it's often said that the heart of the human problem is a problem of the human heart. The heart of the human problem is a problem of the human heart. And that's my heart. And that's your heart. And in Exodus chapter 7, it is very clearly the problem in, in Egypt. The problem for the Israelites is the human heart. And we see in verses 1 to 7 that Pharaoh has a heart heart. And while it would be easy to blame Pharaoh for everything that's happening here, we're also going to see that Moses has a hard heart as well, and the Israelites have a hard heart. We're going to see three sets of human hearts, and they're going to see that they are all hard towards God. It says in verse 3 of chapter 7, let's read verses 1 to 4 together. The Lord said to Moses, See, I have made you like God the Pharaoh, and your brother Aaron shall be your prophet. You shall speak all I commanded to you, and your brother Aaron shall tell Pharaoh to let the people of Israel go out of his land, but I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and though I multiply signs and wonders in the land of Egypt, Pharaoh will not listen to you. Then I will lay my hand on Egypt and bring my hosts, my people, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt by great acts of judgment. The Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch my hand against Egypt and bring out the people of Israel from among them. And Moses and I did so. They did just as the Lord commanded them. And Moses was 80 years old and Aaron was 83 years old when they spoke to Pharaoh. Here in this passage, we see the first set of, of heart hearts and it is Pharaoh's heart. First, Three there says, I will harden Pharaoh's heart. This is also a recap of Exodus 4, 21, where God's already said that I will harden Pharaoh's heart. Although verse 4 also says that Pharaoh will not listen to you either. So recap of Exodus 4, 19 to 20. 
So what are the evidences here of Pharaoh's hard heart? Well, rewind. He has made the Israelites slaves. And then after there's a conflict, he says, well, I'm going to take the straw away, but your workload's not going to continue. See the hardness of the heart? And then he says, well, there's too many of you. I'm going to kill all of the babies in society. I'm going to kill all of the males. This is a megalomaniac whose heart is so hard towards the things of God and the people of God. And as you journey on through Exodus in the coming weeks, you're going to see that in each of the plagues, each of the signs and wonders that God sends uh, to the Egyptians, that Pharaoh's heart has continued to be hardened. Chapter 7, verse 22, Pharaoh's heart became hard. Chapter 8, 15, he hardened his own heart. Chapter 8, verse 19, his heart was hard. Chapter 8, verse 32, Pharaoh hardened his own heart. Verses nine, uh, chapter 9, verse 7, Pharaoh's heart was hard. 9, verse 12, the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. 9, verse 34, Pharaoh hardened his own heart. 10, verse 1, God announced that he had hardened Pharaoh's heart. 10, verse 27, God hardened Pharaoh's heart. And chapter 11, verse 10, God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Pharaoh's heart was hard. If you learn anything in this Exodus, you'll see that Pharaoh's heart was hard because it's a repeated theme. Even after he let the Israelites go, God hardens his heart again and, and he goes and chases after them. And here's a sad part of this. Despite the many opportunities that Pharaoh had to repent and turn to God, he refuses because of the hardness of his heart, because he wants to continue to be God in his own eyes. He doesn't want Yahweh to be his God. He wants to be God and for people to worship him. Pharaoh's heart was hard and that trapped Egypt. But also Moses' heart was hard as well. And we see in the counter, chapter six, he says, send somebody else. I can't speak properly. Chapter four, verse 10, he says, I can't speak properly. Although Moses, for somebody who complained that he couldn't speak, as we see through Exodus, he surely had a lot to say. Exodus 6, verse 12, he says, God, the Israelites won't listen to me. Pharaoh's hardly going to listen either. Moses was really saying, God, just send somebody else. Moses' heart was hard towards God. Although, praise God, Moses' heart was softened. The Israelites' heart were also hard as well as they began complaining in Exodus 5, verse 20. They said to Moses, may the Lord look upon you and judge you. You have made us a stench to Pharaoh and his officials, and you put a sword in their hand to kill us. The Egyptians in their slavery are blaming God and his servants. Exodus 17, as they are journeying through the wilderness, also as they come to Meribah, they also begin to complain again. Moses, we have no water. This is after their great redemption, their great uh, rescue from Israel. So Pharaoh's heart was hard. Moses' heart was hard. The Israelites' hearts were hard as well. The problem of the human heart is the heart of a human problem. As we look around the world today, as we look at the Braniel today, as we look at Belfast today, as we look at Bangkok today, the problem of the human heart is the heart of the human problem. You're possibly asking here, as you heard about Pharaoh's heart being hard, did God harden it or, or did Pharaoh harden his own heart? Well, it's important to realize that Pharaoh was not an innocent man. He was a brutal dictator. He abused and oppressed over a million Israelites. He thought himself to be divine, to be God, to be the greatest world power at the time. He ordained the slaughter of the male Israelites. And the Bible text tells us that Pharaoh hardened his own heart and also tells us that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. It is both and it is not either or. Maybe as a result of Pharaoh's hardness of heart, God continued to harden it. But the Bible allows us to hold these things in tension together. Did God choose us or did we choose God? It's for the whosoever will, and yet God has chosen us. The Bible allows us to hold these things in tension. 
Romans 9, 18 tells us that therefore God has mercy in whom he wants to have mercy and he hardens whom he wants to harden. And from a human perspective, particularly for those of us who are young in the faith, it's hard to get our heads around this. And yet the reality is that we have all sinned against God. The just penalty for that sin is death, Romans 6, 23. And therefore, God's heartening and punishing of a person is not unjust, but he is merciful in comparison to what we actually deserve. We serve, we have a merciful God who always offers people the opportunity to repent and to ask for forgiveness. But why does God harden fire's heart? Well, it says in first. Five here, so that the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord, that I am Yahweh. Romans 9 17, as Paul continues to reflect on this great exodus of the Israelites, it says, For the scripture says to Pharaoh, I raise you up for this very purpose, that I might display my power in you, that my name would be proclaimed throughout the earth. Whatever God does in this world, in heartening Pharaoh's heart, in heartening world leaders' heart, in heartening others' hearts, he is doing it for his glory and his glory alone. And what a glorious picture of God we see in this rescue of the Israelites from Egypt. But as God looks down, as we summarize just this point, he sees Pharaoh's hardness of heart and oppression. We see Moses' heart hard and see is reluctant. We see the Israelites' hearts are hard at their circumstances. And as God looks down on our world today, as he looks down on Belfast and the UK and in the wider world, what does he see? Well, doesn't he see world leaders whose hearts are hard? Doesn't he see a church often with so many people reluctant to serve, to pray, to give, to go? Doesn't he see people whinging and whining, complaining at their leaders, at their elders? Don't do this, don't do that. Millions trapped, enslaved to sin. God looks down and he sees people who are lost without him. So what does God want from us? Ephesians 4, 18 says that they are darkened in their understanding, alien from the life of God because of the ignorance of the sin, them due to the hardness of heart. Our world is full of people who have hard hearts. We are born with a hardness of heart. Our natural inclivity is to harden our hearts rather than to soften them. As we grow older, unless we are kept in line by God's word, we will grow harder in heart. Our natural way is not towards God. It is away from God. It isn't softened to the things of God. It is to harden our hearts. So what is the solution? What is the antidote to all of this? Well, Hebrews 3, it says, Do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, as in the days of tests and in the wilderness. So what is the antidote? How can we um, not be people of hard hearts today? Hebrews 4, 12, the word of God is living and active, sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. We need to be in line with God's word. We need to be allow God's word to be piercer in our hearts. We need to be praying that God would give us a heart of flesh rather than a heart of stone. It's been promised in Ezekiel 36 and Jeremiah 31. In these last days, I will give them a heart of flesh that will replace our heart of stone. Are we praying for our heart of flesh today? For the people around us, for our church, for others. We need to be people of the word to continue to be softened to God. That is a problem God sees, the hardness of heart. We also see the people God uses. As we talked about the 12 footballers in the cave, it's amazing the rescue. He used an anaesthetist to rescue these boys from the cave. Incredible rescue. 
So who were they used to rescue a million people enslaved to the world, superpower Pharaoh, the most powerful man in the world at the time? Well, God uses the most unlikely candidates, two men, 80 and 83, one who can barely speak in the whole a sentence together, both of whom should be in a residential home, never mind on a mission for their divine ruler of the universe to bring a million people out of slavery to the promised land. God doesn't do things the way we think he will do them. God does things through clay pots. God does things through people like you and people like me. Moses himself wrote Psalm 90, verse 10, he says that we are doing well to have three score and ten years and even better to have 80, but it's unlikely I'll have more. D.L. Moody sums up the life of Moses this way. Sent, Moses spent 40 years thinking that he was somebody, 40 years learning that he was nobody, and 40 years of discovering what God can do with a nobody. I wonder in the remaining years of your life, whether you're eight or 80 here, will you use the rest of your years here to see what God can do with a bunch of nobodies? That's what I want to see God do with my life. What can he do with a nobody from Bangor? Because there was no retirement in the kingdom of God. There will always be work to be done. There will always be a gospel to be shared. There will always be prayers to be prayed. You're embracing on the holiday Bible club here over Easter. Go for it. There is work to be done. There are prayers to be prayed. There are people to be reached. The people God uses, people like Moses and Aaron, people like you and me. <laughs> Let's dive down to see a bit more about who Moses was. Well, back in the first one here, it says, And the Lord said to Moses, see, I have made you like God to Pharaoh, and your brother Aaron should be your prophet. What does it mean here that God has made Moses to be like God to Pharaoh? Well, really, what he's saying is that I have given you divine authority. I have sent you to be my, to be God's representative to Pharaoh and to the people. Because Pharaoh thought that he himself was God, and God wanted to show who he really was was and he even gives him a prophet a spokesperson and his brother Aaron so as we continue on earth here as I finish my first 40 years on earth I still find this mind-boggling but God wants to use you and me to be his representatives of people on earth Paul describes it in 2 Corinthians 5 20 therefore we are Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God wants you to be Christ's ambassadors to your friends, to your family, to your neighbors, to the people of the Branio. To use clay pots. Why? So that his glory inside of us can be displayed through the cracks. The reality of Christian ministry is that our greatest weakness is our greatest strength because those are the cracks through God's power is displayed. God's power and God's spirit is poured out to all of us, young and old, male and female. God wants to use all of us in his work. What was the key to Moses and Aaron's in the street? Was it their wins and personalities? Was it their youthful seal? Was it something great about themselves? No, it was their obedience to God's call on their lives. And as you go now through the 10 plagues of Israel, we see here that they did just as the Lord commanded them. It's a repeated phrase Again, just as the Lord commanded them. And as they say, their fears and their inhibitions will move into the background as they continue to serve and to follow God in obedience. And as we follow God in our obedience today, our fears and our inhibitions will move to the background rather than being in the foreground. Here's the truth of the matter. God wants to use you, whatever age you are, whatever excuse you have 
whatever previous attitude you have, whether you're male or female, young or old Christian for two years or 20 years, God wants to use us. Maybe you think God can't use you. You're too weak, you're too young, you're too old, you're too broken. You think there's been too many failures in your life. Well, consider these people that God has used throughout history. Noah was a drunk, Abraham was too old, Isaac was a daydreamer, Jacob was a liar, Leah was ugly, Joseph was abused, Moses was a murderer, Gideon was afraid, Samson was a flirt, Rahab was a prostitute, Jeremiah and Timothy were too young, David was an adulterer, Elijah was suicidal, Isaiah preached naked, Jonah ran away from God, Job went bankrupt. John the Baptist ate bugs. Peter denied Jesus. The disciples all fell asleep while praying. The Samaritan woman was the fourth five times. Zacchaeus was too small. Paul was too religious. Timothy had an ulcer and Lazarus was dead. Think again if you think God can't use you. God can certainly use you. And here's the truth again. God delights to use us as broken, cracked, clay pot so that his light shines through us i wonder are we willing to serve him to trust him to obey him it's a problem god sees as a problem of the human heart but if we see the people god uses moses and iron and that takes us finally to the power that god displays exodus 7 and verses 8 to the and we see the power that God displays here in verses 8 to 13 as a prelude to the, to the plagues or to the signs and wonders of Israel where the staff becomes a serpent and swallows up the others. But in this part of the passage what we see is exodus 7 is not actually against it's not actually moses against pharaoh it's not actually israel against egypt exodus 7 is about god against all of the forces of evil and darkness including satan himself and that is what god's power is going to be displayed against and it's quite helpful for us today as we seek to serve God, as challenges come from outside the church and as challenges come from inside the church as well, to remember Ephesians 6, verse 12, that our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. We are encouraged to fight the good fight. Can I encourage you to fight the right enemy in these days? The enemies aren't the people that you encounter. The enemies are the unseen forces of darkness in this world. Can I encourage you to fight the good fight and don't fight the wrong fight? Don't begin to fight each other. Don't begin to fight against some people in the primal. Fight against the forces of darkness. And as was said in the announcements, how we do that is on our knees in prayer. Let's read verses 8 to 13 together as we see the, the power of God display. Then the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, when Pharaoh says to you, prove yourself by working a miracle, then you shall say to Aaron, take the staff and cast it down before Pharaoh, that it may become a serpent. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and did just as the Lord commanded. Aaron cast down his staff before Pharaoh and his servants, and it became a serpent. Then Pharaoh summons the wise men and the sorcerers, and they, the magicians of Egypt, also did the same by their secret arts. For each man cast down his staff, and they became serpents. But Aaron's staff swallowed up their staffs. Still Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he would not listen to them, as the Lord had said. How often do we hear 
all unbelievers say, if I just got a sign for God, if God just showed some of his power to me right here, right now, then I would believe. How often have we heard that? So often, and yet here, Pharaoh gets that sign for himself, and it doesn't cause him to believe. It causes his heart to become harder. And it was the same in Jesus' day as well, as he went around doing signs and wonders and miraculous acts. It didn't cause people to follow him in repentance and faith. It caused people to reject him. It caused people to crucify him ultimately. Signs and wonders and miracles today are given to us to confirm God's word. Pharaoh had plenty of signs, but he still hardened his heart. And what we see here in this amazing display of God's power is a preview of the plagues that are to come. And there's four things that we see here that you're going to see in all of the plagues as well. You're going to see the obedience of Moses and Ark. You're going to see counterfeit miracles in Egypt. You're going to see God's superior power, and you're going to see a heart in the Pharaoh's heart here. And the sign here is a turn, a staff into a serpent. Why on earth choose this? Well, a serpent is a symbol of Pharaoh's authority. And it's also a prominent figure in Genesis 3. Are we seeing all of the connections here? The staff that becomes a serpent is actually a direct attack on Pharaoh's authority and his desire to be worshipped as a god. Moses and Aaron, as gods, ask them to do, they don't beat around the bush with Pharaoh. No, they go for the juggler here and say, Pharaoh, you and your sign of a serpent that you worship and adore, you are not God. Yahweh alone is God. So what happens? Moses and Aaron obey. The staff turns into a serpent and the Egyptians replicate the miracle. It shows that the dynamic forces are at work. But then what happens? God's serpent swallows up all of these other little serpents of the day. And the point here is quite clear. The point here should be obvious for Pharaoh, and it should be obvious for us, that God is stronger than you. God is greater than you. As we've already reflected in our service today, that God is the King of kings and that he is the Lord of gods. And at his name, every knee will bow, including the human superpowers of the day. Earthly kings and queens will bow before him. Satan will also bow before him. He's been thrown out of heaven. He's been given some authority on earth, but he is a defeated foe. He has only given the power and the rule that he has allowed. It is limited, but God's power and rule is unlimited. And just here as we see God's serpent swallow up all of the other serpents. In just a few chapters' time, we're going to see the sea swallow up the, the armies of Egypt. This miracle is going to be even greater seen as we see in that day that we've been celebrating around the table today, that on the cross, Christ is going to crush the serpent's head. And he is going to swallow up death, crying, it is finished. Sadly, Pharaoh's heart is hardened, not for the first time here, which takes us on to the 10 plagues. You're going to be following all of these plagues. You see the first of the plagues that display God's power in verses 14 to 25, where the water in the Nile turns to blood. It's another direct attack on one of the gods of Egypt. And God is saying that your life source does not come from the Nile. It does not come from water. It comes from me alone. As you overview the plagues, you're going to see the first nine of them are set in three sets of three, and they get worse and worse and worse and worse, increasing in severity as they go because people are not worshiping God as he should be worshipped. 
as we conclude the day, as we see that salvation belongs to the Lord. We have clearly seen the problem God sees is the hardness of heart. We have seen the people God uses and the power that God displays. As we think about 2023 today, as Castlereagh Community Church, God sees some of our hardness of hearts. God sees the hard hearts in the Braniel and Belfast and beyond. But God wants to use us. And we will walk in obedience to him, just as Moses and Aaron walked in obedience to God in their day. He will use us. He will give us a heart of flesh. Maybe you're here and you and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, or you're watching online and you don't know him. Come to Christ in repentance and faith. Bring your heart, heart to him, and he will give you a heart of flesh. Do it before it is too late. Don't harden your heart any longer. Maybe you have come to the cross already. God wants to use people like you and people like me. God wants to, to bring people to himself. I wonder, are you ready to go? To go into the world? Who does God want you to talk to directly in your neighborhood, in your office place tomorrow, in your family, in your friendship groups? But also, this great rescue of the Israelites from Egypt punches towards an even greater rescue for us to glory in. So we see that the deliverer came as one greater than Moses, one who was also wanted dead as a baby, one who would also be a servant of his people, one who would also be a mediator between God and his people, one who would also be a priest, one who would also be a deliverer, the one who would be God to the people. This morning, let us not rejoice in how great Moses is, but let us rejoice in how great the Lord Jesus Christ is, the one who came to be our rescuer, to be our redeemer, to be our reconciler, to be the saviour of the world. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me because salvation belongs to the Lord. And there's only one name under heaven by which we might be saved. May we be lost in wonder, lost in awe, and lost in love forevermore because of what Christ has done for us and the deliverance and the salvation that God has given to us. And always remember, salvation belongs to the Lord.